journey. We, we really enjoyed writing the book. It's, I've been married for 30 years. It took us almost 20 years to write the book as we travelled around the world. And we've been very lucky the places we've been to. And I'd like to take you to a place that we went to last year that was quite unique. This is Bhutan. And we found this really, really interesting. They are trying to be the last traditional Buddhist kingdom in the world. We thought we'd be true tourists. This is the famous Tiger's Nest Monastery. We were as far away from Sydney as possible. And we thought after a six hour climb, <coughs> we would discover something amazing away from all our life. So we put on our Gore-Tex shoes, our travel pants, got rid of the jacket, the sweatshirt, um, shirt, the beautiful backpack. I had an app on my phone that was telling me how far I walked, tracking my heart rate. Real tourists. And up we go. And when our guide came to pick us up, he looked like he was dressed in pyjamas. He turned up in the traditional Bhutanese uniform. He had an umbrella as a walking stick. He had normal shoes, no hat, no Gore-Tex pants, no apps. And he was carrying a, a basket of rice for us to have at lunch. A real difference. As we started walking towards the top, it was hard work, it was really tiring, we were fairly fit, we were real tourists. We couldn't believe the type of people that were going there. And it was quite embarrassing when we met this 70 year old lady that was also making the pilgrimage because it's a very holy site, the tiger's nest. And so she was trying to get up to this pilgrimage. And when we finally got to the top and we got into the monastery and there was the bunk. And we thought, wow, this is going to be the most traditional experience we've ever had in our life. We could not be further away from our everyday Western life working with companies. Maybe this Buddhist monk will give us the most incredible ancient traditional wisdom that has been locked into Tiger's Nest for many years. And just as we were about to go in and get the blessing from the Buddha, and we were so excited we got delayed because he pulled out his mobile phone <laughs> and ordered a pizza. Now, I don't speak Zonga, so I don't know what he ordered, but it was the most bizarre thing. We thought we had gone as far away possible from civilization. And just as he was going to do something magic, hold on, ding, 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 phone rings. Hey, damn, wherever you go. Now, Bhutan is a very interesting country because they are struggling with trying to maintain to be the most traditional country in the world. That you cannot build over five stories. You have to use the Bhutan paint. No McDonald's or KFC exists. No traffic lights exist. You need a special visa to get in. And this concept of the GNH, the gross national happiness, it is not a gimmick. We tend to think of it as, oh, it's Bhutan's tourist push. It's actually got nothing to do with tourists. The king, and the politicians have decided that Bhutan's going to do something different. They're going to hang on to their traditional way of life, but they're also going to embrace modernity. But we have got a beautiful interview, it's on our YouTube channel, with the Minister of Education talking about this paradox, this challenge that Bhutan is having to maintain its traditional culture, but at the same time be in the 21st century. And so even out in the villages, as far as you could get, you could ask children about the GNH and they would tell you the four pillars. And every decision in Bhutan is based around the four pillars. Amazing concept of a country that knows its mission statement. I wonder if I went to your employees and asked you what your mission statement was. Could they say it like this kid? So later that day or I think the next day we came down one of the rivers rafting and I couldn't but help think of the conversation of the mobile phone and the monk and Mr Tuxen the education minister said this is what we're struggling with we must maintain our tradition but we also cannot be stupid to the fact that if we don't move into the 21st century we'll be left behind and as we we're coming down the river, I realised that a good river guide will not come down the middle of the river. A good river guide will always use 
both sides of the river. There are times they will go right over here and there are times they will go right over here. And it made me think about the mobile and the monk, that Bhutan to be successful, and they don't have a lot of resources, for them to be successful they're going to need to really map that path very carefully to keep that tradition and keep modernity. And so what my wife has been researching at Sydney University is called the paradox theory. And you'll start to hear a lot more about this in the next coming years, about what is the paradox theory. It really is about embracing exploration, that openness, the, the, tour, the traveler, and preservation on this side, and getting them working properly. And we're calling this a paradoxical pairing. So I'm interested in your idea. Do you tend to focus more on the openness, exploring new ideas, or do you tend to track down the maintaining current systems? If you were coming down that river, which side would you be most likely on? There's no right or wrong, because what I want to show you is we have to use the whole river. Now, I don't know if you're into skiing or if you're into car racing, but both a champion skier and a champion car racer will always use the full track. You will not win a car race if you stay on the left side of the road the whole way around the track. And you will not win a car race if you stay on the right hand side of the road. A company that tracks down the left hand side of the paradox will not win the race. A company that tracks down the right-hand side of the paradox will not win the race because the fast company, the one that will win it, will be the company that uses the entire road. Mm -hmm.